goal of this video is to prove that degrees of field extensions are multiplicative, and then to see some nice quick consequences of how to use that fact. So let's suppose that we have fields F, K, and L, where uh, L is an extension of K and K is an extension of F. So L is also an extension of F. Then the degree of L over F is the product of the degree of L over K and the degree of K over F, where, okay, if these are all positive integers, it's clear what this means. But if one side is infinite, then the other side is infinite as well. So, yeah. Okay, so I, I find it easiest to think about this with a little diagram where you have L, K, F. This looks just like a subgroup diagram where uh, it's common to see the, the lines showing this inclusion being marked with the degree of the corresponding field extension. So what this is saying is we could take this line from L down to F, which is the degree of L over F. And you could take this line uh, that is the degree of L over K and this line that is the degree of K over F. And whether you go this way or you take the product of these two intermediate pieces, you get the same thing. So I want to say that this looks just like the corresponding result for groups, that if you have a group G with a subgroup H and then another subgroup, sorry, a subgroup K and then another subgroup H, and uh, H is also a subgroup of K, then the index of H and G is the product of the index of K and G times the index of H and K. And we proved this all the way back in lecture seven, video one of Math 206A. So this is an exercise in section 3.2 of Dummett and Foot. All right, so if you believe that this theorem is true, as an immediate consequence, if you have L over F being a finite extension, and K being any subfield of L that contains F so that we have this kind of situation, uh, F contained in L contained in, sorry, F contained in K contained in L, then the degree of K over F divides the degree of L over F. And why is that? Because the degree of L over F is the degree of K over F times something that is, uh, either a positive integer or everything is infinite. Oh yeah, so in the case that L over F is a finite extension, you don't have this infinite situation. Uh, so this is some finite number that's equal to this finite number times whatever this is. So the degree of K over F divides the degree of L over F. Okay, so let's prove theorem 14. And the idea is that really, this is just a statement about vector spaces where you think of a field extension as giving a vector, the bigger field as being a vector space over the smaller field where the degree is equal to the dimension of that vector space. So we're just going to write down bases for all of these vector spaces. And another idea is that uh, we're going to separate the case where L over K and K over F are finite from the case where one of these two things is infinite. Um, yeah, we'll deal with this where one side is infinite, the other is infinite as well. We'll deal with that separately at the end. Okay, so let's suppose that the degree of L over K is M. And let's say that alpha one up through alpha M is a basis for L over K. So what does that mean? These are a bunch of elements of L that are linearly independent and uh, they span L as a vector space over K. All right, so let's also suppose that K over F, the degree, this is finite. Let's suppose that it's N and let's say that beta one up through beta N are a basis for K over F. So these are a bunch of elements of K that are linearly independent over F and they span K as a vector space over F. And we're gonna, uh, prove that this statement holds by actually writing down a basis of size n times m for l as a vector space over f. What is that set of n times m elements going to be? Well, the only reasonable set of n times m elements that uh, we have access to right now is the set of all these alpha i times beta j's. So first, this makes sense, right? Because uh, K is contained in L, 
these beta one through beta n's, these are elements of k, but they're also elements of L. So each alpha i times beta j is an L. How many elements do we have? Well, there's m choices for our alpha i and n choices for our beta j. So all together, we get n times m elements that give a basis for L over f. So how are we going to prove that this is a basis? We'll do this in two pieces. We'll show first that these elements span L, that if we take uh, linear combinations of these elements with coefficients in f, we can write down any elements of L. And then once we do that, we'll show that these are also linearly independent over f, that if we have a linear combination of these n times m elements with coefficients in f that's equal to 0 in L, then every one of those coefficients is equal to 0. OK, so I'll pause and erase. And we'll first do span, and then we'll do linearly independent. We have these n times m elements of L that we want to prove give a basis for L over f. Where did they come from? They came from taking a basis for L over k and taking a basis for f over k. And first, we want to prove that they span L. All right, so what do we know? We have a basis for L over k, right? So that means that any element of L, let's say gamma, can be written as a linear combination of these basis elements, alpha 1 up through alpha m, where the coefficients a1 up through am are in k. All right, but what do we know about k? We have a basis for k over f. So we know that we can write any elements of k as a linear combination with coefficients in f of beta 1 up through beta m. So what are some elements of uh, k that we care about? Well, we have these uh, a1 up through am. These are a bunch of elements of k. So what I've written here is every element of k, including a1 up through am, can be written as an f linear combination of beta 1 up through beta m. So if you take ai to be equal to uh, this linear combination of beta 1 up through beta n, this basis for k over f, what does that mean? We know that there exists beta i1 up through beta i n in f such that a i is beta i1 beta, sorry, b i1 beta 1 plus 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 b i n beta f. So these coefficients in f come from expressing each one of these a i's as a linear combination of this basis beta 1 up through beta n. Now we're just going to take this and substitute back into our original. Uh, expression here. And what we get is we get a sum where i goes from 1 to m and j goes from 1 to n of b i j times alpha i beta j. So what is that giving us? That's giving us our element of L as a linear combination of our special elements alpha i times beta j, where the coefficients b i j are all in f. So what are we seeing? We're seeing that these elements span L as a vector space over f. All right, so what do we have to do to show that they're actually a basis? Is now we have to show that they're linearly independent. OK, so how do we do that? Well, we suppose that there is a relation, that there is some linear combination, some beta ij times alpha i times beta j, where i goes from 1 to m and j goes from 1 to n, and these beta ij's are all in f, that is equal to 0 in L. And what we need to prove is that if this holds, then every one of these b i j's needs to be equal to 0. OK, so we're going to do that using the fact that uh, alpha 1 up through alpha m and is linearly independent as a set, and beta 1 up through beta n is linearly independent so the fact that these sets are linearly independent is going to tell us that this one is as well. OK, so I'm going to pause and erase. And then I'll finish the details of this statement, which is going to complete the proof of this theorem in case 1, when L over k and k over f are both finite extensions. And then we'll talk about the case where uh, one of these three extensions that we're looking at is infinite. 
So we've assumed that there is this linear combination of these elements alpha i times beta j with our coefficients b i j in f that gives us zero in L. So what we're going to do is use this expression bi1 times beta1 plus 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 bin times beta n to define elements a1 up through a m in k. So what do I mean? I want to define a i to be the elements in k given by bi1 beta1 plus 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 bin beta n where we know what these bijs are, they come from this relation that we assume that we had. Okay, so if you make those definitions of ai, then you'll see that a1 alpha 1 plus 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 a2 alpha 2 plus 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 am alpha m is equal to zero. That's just rewriting this big sum in terms of uh, these ais. All right, and this is good because now we have a relation among our elements, alpha one up through alpha m, where the coefficients are a bunch of elements of k. But alpha one up through alpha m are a basis for L over k. So the only way that you can take a k linear combination of them and get zero is if every one of your coefficients is zero. So that means a one is zero, a two is zero, up through a m is zero. But now what does that mean? Remember how we defined a i is B i one beta one plus 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 B i n beta n. So if this is equal to zero, then because beta one up through beta n is a basis for k over f, what do we have here? We have a linear combination of our basis with coefficients in f that's equal to zero in k. But the only way to take this f linear combination of basis elements and get zero is for every one of the coefficients to be zero. So ai is zero means that bi1 is zero and bi2 is zero up through bin is zero. And if this is true for every ai, then all of these bijs are equal to zero. And that is the thing that we wanted to prove to show that this set is linearly independent. So we have this set of n times m elements that is both a spanning set for L as a vector space over F, and it's a linearly independent set, so it's a basis for L over F. So we have seen that the degree of L over F is the product of the degrees of L over K and the degree of K over F. All right, so that completes the proof in the case that L over K and K over F are both finite extensions. So I'm going to pause and erase, and I'll talk about um, the case where at least one of these extensions in the statement of this theorem is infinite. And then I'll talk about some quick consequences of this theorem. Let's finish the proof of this theorem. So we've seen that in the case that L over K and K over F are both finite extensions, the degree of L over F is the product of the degree of L over K and the degree of K over F. So what we want to do now is say, we have this equation that holds when all the extensions are finite. But if one side of that equation is infinite, then the other is infinite as well. And we have these three terms, each of which could be infinite. And we're just going to go one at a time and show that if one of them is infinite, then the other side of the equation is infinite too. So first, let's consider the case that k over f is infinite. The degree of this extension is infinite. Then what does that mean? This is really a thing about vector spaces from here on out. There's a set of infinitely many elements of K that are linearly independent over F. L is an extension of K. So every one of those elements in that set is also in L. So that means that we could just take the same set of infinitely many elements, and that's a set of infinitely many elements of L that are linearly independent over F. So the degree of L over F is also infinite. Okay. Next, let's think about the case where the degree of L over K is infinite. So this means that there's infinitely many elements of L that are linearly independent over K. That means that if we have a linear combination of this infinite set of elements that is equal to zero in L, where the coefficients are in K, 
all of those coefficients have to be zero. So if you think about the set of coefficients, k is an extension of f. So if you take linear combinations with coefficients in k, that's a bigger set of things than if you take linear combinations of these elements with coefficients in f. So just taking the same infinite set of elements, there are also infinitely many elements of L that are linearly independent over F. If we had a linear combination of these elements with coefficients in F that was equal to zero without having all the coefficients be zero, then of course we would have a linear combination with coefficients in K that was equal to zero where not all the coefficients were zero because all these elements of F are also elements of K. Okay, so what does that show? That the degree of L over F is infinite also. Okay, so the last piece is if the degree of L over F is infinite, then we know that either the degree of L over K has to be infinite or the degree of L over F has to be, sorry, the degree of uh, K over F has to be infinite because we proved in case one that if this degree and this degree are both finite, then this degree is finite as well, equal to the product of the two of them. So that completes the proof of uh, theorem 14. So the important thing to remember here is the case where all of your extensions are finite. And the important idea is going to be to write down a basis for L as a vector space over K and write down a basis for K as a vector space over F and show that you can take products of these basis elements and those basis elements to get a basis for L over F. All right, so let's just see some quick examples of what this multiplicity, multiplicativity of degrees of field extensions tells us. So let's take this extension that we get from a real root of the polynomial x cubed minus 3x minus 1. So this polynomial is irreducible in Q bracket x. Uh, it's not difficult to see that it has exactly one root in the interval between 1 and 2 in the real numbers. So uh, the minimal polynomial of this root is x cubed minus 3x minus 1. So this extension has degree 3. All right, so let's see that the square root of 2 is not in the field generated by this alpha over q. Well, if it were, then what would that tell us? Then the square root of 2 would be in this field. And the field generated by the square root of 2 over q would be contained in this field q adjoint alpha. But now, this also contains q. And the, uh, using this result, the degree of q adjoint square root of 2 over q doesn't divide the degree of the whole extension q adjoint alpha over q, because this degree is 2, and this degree we see is 3. So it's not possible for q adjoint square root of 2 to be a subfield of q adjoint alpha. This one has degree 2 over q. This one has degree 3 over q. And 2 doesn't divide 3. OK, let's see another example. Let's write sixth root of 2 here to denote the positive sixth root of 2 in the real numbers. So the minimal polynomial of this root is x to the sixth minus 2. So that's a degree 6 extension. And this field has q adjoint square root of 2 as a subfield. Why? Because square root of 2 is in this field. Because if you cube the sixth root of 2, you get the square root of 2. So what does that mean? We have this diagram of field extensions. We have q at the bottom, q adjoint square root of 2, and then q adjoint the sixth root of 2. We know that q adjoint square root of 2 has degree 2 over q, and I'm marking this little line with a 2, like I, I said was common. And the whole extension has degree 6 over q. So that immediately implies, because of the multiplicativity, that the degree of q adjoint the sixth root of 2 over q adjoint square root of 2 has to be 3. So what is this degree? This is the degree of the minimal polynomial of the element sixth root of 2 over q adjoint the square root of 2. So one polynomial with coefficients in q adjoint square root of 2 that's monic, that is satisfied by this element sixth root of 2, 
is x cubed minus the square root of two. It's not obvious to me that this polynomial is irreducible in q adjoint square root of two bracket x. But the fact that this field extension has degree three says that the degree of this minimal polynomial has to be three, which tells you here's some polynomial, monic polynomial that this element satisfies uh, with coefficients in q adjoint square root of two bracket x. Uh, sorry, with coefficients in q adjoint square root of two. So it has to be irreducible. OK, so these are just some quick examples of how theorem 14 about the multiplicativity of the degrees of field extensions and this corollary that we saw about how uh, the degree of k over f has to divide the degree of l over f, how these can be useful in concrete examples. <laughs>